I Should Be Writing number 376. Hi there. Welcome to I Should Be Writing, the podcast for wannabe fiction writers. I'm your host, Murr. And lately I've been doing a whole bunch of uh, proposal work. I'm doing some proposal for some interactive fiction and some proposals for other projects. And I have a novel proposal in to my agent. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't look like there will be a sequel to Six Wakes anytime soon. So I am putting my attention to other things. I don't have a lot of time. I'm trying to get one up every Monday, and it is Monday afternoon or Monday evening, and I have to go out in a moment, so I wanted to get something uh, recorded. There's, there's, uh, I've been trying to stay off Twitter lately. Sometimes I get on Twitter and I'm interested and informed and engaged, and other times I get on Twitter and I'm depressed and sad and feel like nothing's worth anything. So, when I'm in the latter mood, I think maybe I'll just stay off Twitter. And so then I come back and everyone's up in a froth about something and it takes me a little while to figure out what's going on. And today's froth seems to be about a an article that came out recently about how if you don't if you don't write every day you might as well just quit. And a whole bunch of writers are really pissed off and, and saying their counter comments to this. And from my point of view, um, here's the deal. One, it's clickbait. You don't, you don't use maybe or sometimes or for certain people. You don't use those words in a headline. You want clickbait. You want to make people mad and make people interested. Unfortunately, that's the way our brains are wired. So I just looked at it and thought, that's clickbait. But you know, I was dismayed by similar advice when I started out. It was uh, reading Zen and the Art of Writing by Red Bradbury, and I was thinking if I didn't... He was saying how he approached writing, and I thought, well, I don't do it like that. And I, 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 if, if Ray Bradbury does it like that, and he's the master, then, then what am I? And, you know, it, it did put me off for a little while. Writing every day is beneficial if it works for you. We started the magic spreadsheet, which which uh, encourages the writing habit. The reason why people say you should write every day is because if you make it a habit, you'll do it. If you're a beginner and you're not into something, or you don't have confidence, then you may just back off. But if you have a rule that you have to write every day, well, then you'll still do it. That's why that's there, is so you can make a habit of it. If the thought, I have to write every day, brings nothing but guilt and dismay to you, and that stops you from writing, then that's not good either. The rule is not you have to write every day. The rule is you have to finish things. And if by finishing things you write every day, great. Or if by finishing things, or if by binge writing every weekend and you finish things, that's great too. If you write every other day, if you write when you have an idea for a story and you write a whole bunch and then when you're done, you stop writing for a little while till you have an idea for another story. That's good too. You have to think about what works for you. And no one would ever click on that headline because it's not divisive. And it also encourages people to think for themselves, which you really don't encourage people to do on the internet. As much as I like giving writing advice, I have to tell you that really your most of the questions that you have for me are answered with whatever works best for you is the right answer. What time of day should you write? Whatever works best for you. Try different times. See what works for you. See when you feel most creative. See when your schedule allows it. Should you write every day? Whatever works for you. You know, a couple of weeks ago I talked about those rules and why we tell beginners those rules. It's because it is hard to think for yourself when you're starting something new. You want someone to hold your hand and say, here's the way it can be done. Why don't you try it? And if it doesn't work, then okay, well, here's another way it can be done. How about that? But it just, it really does bother me. Well, it bothers me that we're all wired to, to click on those clickbaity things. 
to deny the article its clicks, I believe Daniel Jose Older uh, put his, uh, just took screenshots of the entire article and uh, released it on Twitter. Absolutes aren't safe. They're not healthy. And they're not always going to be what is going to benefit you. And I really hate the thought, hate it, that somebody might think that if they read this article and they hear this absolute and they think it doesn't work for them, that they're going to stop writing, that they're going to quit because the article said to. And you may scoff. You may think, well, I mean, you're being stupid. You're, you're, why would you let this article tell you what to do? Well, it's the perceived, um, it's the perceived expert. You go to experts to find, um, find out ad advice. <clears throat> you want to find out what advice on what to do and how to do it, and then you do it. That's why you're listening to this show, I assume. So yeah, we do listen to advice, and if someone says, this is the absolute worst thing you could do, we think, oh, well, crap, I better not do that. But it's just upsetting thinking that th that clickbait article will make someone quit. It just makes me angry thinking about it. Listen, you find what works for you. Don't be afraid to try different things. Don't be afraid to binge write. Don't be afraid to try NaNoWriMo. Don't be afraid to write 200 words a day. Don't be afraid to... Uh, just try anything. Just write the story and finish it. And you know what? If you don't feel ready to finish a story, then write something else. The sad thing about not being published is that nobody cares what you're working on. You know, you don't have agents interested, you don't have publishers interested, you don't have people telling you that there's a deadline, you don't have promised money coming in. No one cares. And the wonderful thing about being an unpublished writer is that nobody cares what you're working on, which means you can do anything you want. You can try anything. And you don't appreciate that freedom until it's taken from you. Like a lot of people have said, they want sequels to my books that my publishers didn't want sequels to. And I think, well, gee, in today's crowdfunding world, I could Kickstarter them. Yes, and that's a very real possibility. But then I have the whole thing of, but I have another book I have to do. And it's due X date. And I have to figure out if I can write the sequel that I have no advance for. Or write this other book that I do have an advance for. Yeah, I could still make my own decisions, but it's a it's a harder decision simply because I have to decide whether I'm going to take the money in hand or do the work and then get the money. And hope I get the money, I should say. So, um it, it's a it, it is a challenging thing either way. For today's interview, yes, I'm bringing interviews back on occasion. I have uh Robin Bennis, the author of The Guns Above, which came out in early May. So Robin talked to me a couple of weeks ago, and uh, we will hear about how to start a story, how to work on characters, and more coming up. Welcome back to I Should Be Writing, and I am pleased to have on the show Robin Bennis. I'm pleased to be here. It's it's great to have you. You have a debut book called The Guns Above, and all I keep hearing is, oh my god, The Guns Above, get this book. So <laughs> you've got some buzz going on. I'm, I'm quite impressed. I, uh, you know, a lot of that is, uh, I've got to thank my editor and the public publicity team at, uh, at Tor. Um, they have done a great job of getting the news out there, and... Uh, I, you know, it's a fun book, I think, so people are enjoying it. Excellent. Well, tell us a little bit about it. Uh, so The Guns Above is about, uh, it's a dual point of view book uh, about Josette Dupre and uh, Lord Bernat Hinkle. Uh, Josette, uh, as, we, uh, as we meet her, has just been in a pretty horrific uh, uh, airship crash 
and she is lying prone on the battlefield. She doesn't even know who won the battle. She knows it's over, and she knows it's a rout. Uh, and <clears throat> comes to learn that it was actually, comes to remember, rather, uh, that it was, in fact, her uh, little maneuver that uh, turned the tide and uh, won the battle for her country, Garnia. And as a reward for this, the king has decided to use her as a political pawn. Uh, she makes a convenient war hero. And since they have a manpower shortage, uh, the king is looking to get women more involved in the army in, uh, in both combat and non-combat roles. And she becomes the figurehead for this, which does not sit well with her uh, commanding officers. Bernat is, uh, enters the story at this point, and he is sent to spy on her. And while he's there, he has some fun sexually harassing her and uh, making all kinds of uh, lewd and suggestive remarks, uh, most of which are based on uh, things that I've experienced in biotech. So, you know, there's a hint of realism to them, but, you know, in a funny way. Okay. Um I was, I'm glad you pointed out the exact point at which your book starts because, interestingly enough, I've gotten a lot of questions recently about people who are, they know what their story is, but they're unsure of how to start it. And I was very interested to see a lot of people start things like maybe too far ahead of action, and some people start perfectly within the action to get you excited about it. Some people start with too much action and not enough character, so you know something's going on, but you're not sure why you care. <laughs> but you went right after the action. So we've got someone who's lying on the ground covered in blood, not sure what's going on, and there goes the story. So I, I want to know a little bit about why you chose to start it there, and if you actually tried out a couple of other places to start the story beforehand. That was always my plan, and because it's such a great cheat, isn't it? It's um, it's not quite. I guess it is technically in media res. Um, you know, uh, we we start just after the action. The character uh, has a lot of questions about what has happened while she has been unconscious, which is a natural vehicle to, you know, allow the uh, omniscient snarky narrator, narrator uh, to to speculate and in so doing to you know slip some exposition in between the cracks um, but mainly it's a precarious situation so it, it it instantly kind of makes the reader interested and so yeah I was always going to use that cheat now why do you call it a cheat uh, <laughs> It's a little bit cheap, isn't it? Um, uh, I guess you know you're right. It um, if I started calling every every um, every cheat a cheat, I'd have to call every cheat a cheat. Uh, it's uh, it is it is a fairly easy way though to get the reader into the story and slip them some information, plus build sympathy for the character, um, because anyone who's in kind of Anyone who's in a Swedish situation, that's the one thing every human being on Earth knows knows about, right? Mm -hmm. And will instantly sympathize with. So you put your character in a kind of a Swedish situation where they don't know what to do, they don't quite know what's going on, and you can not only, you know, get the exposition that you need out there in a smooth way that doesn't disrupt that very important chapter one flow... You know, chapter one just has to sparkle and pop and move along super fast if you want to grab the reader's attention. Um, <clears throat> and there aren't many ways to slip exposition into that. So just kind of starting after uh, some horrific action uh, is, uh, you know, let's call it a useful technique instead of a cheat. Okay. Uh, we'll, 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 I'll flatter myself. Okay. Uh, so this is your first novel, but you sound like you are pretty seasoned. Um, what have you <laughs> written before this? This is my debut novel. Oh, um, of course. That's, yeah. that's a difference. That's an important distinction. Uh, my first novel, at some point, 
I will eventually set up a Patreon and the $10,000 a month level, uh, the reward will be you get to read a chapter of this every month. Oh my. Uh, yeah, it's bad. It's bad. Uh, it is a... <laughs> It is a chosen one uh, story uh, in the uh, middle grades uh, kind of area about a young, awkward girl, teenage girl who is not socially popular, uh, showing it to everybody and saving the world. It's it's ridiculous. It's every it's every sort of wrong. That just sounds like wish fulfillment. <laughs> it is. It, there's a lot of wish fulfillment. Uh, when you learn, however, that I wrote this in my 30s, it becomes a little more pathetic. Nah. Uh, <laughs> the uh, the plot was looked like spaghetti. Uh, all of these different characters. You know, I had. I think I had just read Game of Thrones, and I'm like, I'm gonna write. Every character, every character in this world, I'm going to have you and you and you and you and all your plots are going to interact and nobody could figure out what the hell was going on, though. Mm -hmm. uh, you forget that this is your world and you love it and you know everything about it, but the reader is very new to it. Uh, and I I really forgot that lesson or, or hadn't learned it yet uh, on this novel. It was also like 300,000 words, which is not a great first novel length. Wow. Yeah, I made just about every mistake you can make. But you know what? I got them all out. That's I got excellent. it out of my system. Yeah. <laughs> so did you have the pro this, this is one thing that breaks my heart with new writers is when they have a book that they are in love with and they're so in love with it that all they ever want to do is edit it to make it better and not actually accept the fact that <laughs> it's a good beginner move and you learned a lot, and now it's time to move on. Just like you don't want to marry that person you quote-unquote <laughs> went steady with in seventh grade. Mm -hmm. So so how did, did you have a period of time like this, or were you happy to achieve this and then move on? I had a couple years where I tried to salvage this book, and... That was a big mistake because I could have written I could have written another novel in that time mm -hmm. uh, in the time that I spent trying to untangle the threads of of this book. It, and, you know, to give myself some credit, the characters were pretty cool. The dialogue was good. You know, towards the end, my prose got pretty snappy. Uh, the beginning, not so much. Right. Uh, there were a lot of things to like about this book, and I was I was kind of in love with it. Uh, but I really should have just dropped it and moved on. Uh, and eventually I did. And I started, uh, I started writing what would become the guns above and that worked out very well. Do you ever think you'll go back to it or, or are you accepting it as a learning experience? I've pretty much accepted it as a learning experience oh, about good. the only, yeah, I know. Right. It's, um, <laughs> You know, there's always that person in your life that you're tempted to go back to, even though you know it's unhealthy for yeah. you. Yeah. Um, and I'm certainly tempted. Uh, but I recognize now that it is, it's like four novels worth of work to salvage this one novel. And it's just not worth it. Mm -hmm. I think the only way I would go back and try to salvage it is if, you know, someone came along and said, hey, uh, why don't I chart out all this plot for you and I'll try to untangle it and you can keep all the money from it. Then I would say yes. If any of your listeners are interested, you can contact me on Twitter. Yeah. Yeah, I've got a piece like that. It's I'm so sick of it that, that if somebody wanted to publish it, I'd be like, you find someone to edit it. Go for it. Yes, yes, exactly. Make it not suck. Yeah. Make the good parts come out, and then we'll talk. But yeah. I don't want to have anything to do with that. Yeah. So uh, the book's been out for a couple of weeks, which means you finished it like a year ago or something. So Ooh, what have you been working even on? Even longer, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so for the past year, I have been working on the sequel. So we are tentatively calling that by fire above. Uh, I am in fact just about to turn in the revisions that will hopefully go to copy edit. And it is about, uh, it has more of a loyalty theme to it. So we kind of, um, 
<clears throat> you know, we we explored, we got a good, you know, foundation for Garnia and these characters in the first book. And uh, we're kind of going to go into their loyalties now and explore that theme. And we're going to see a little bit more. If you've, uh, if you've read any of the book, you know Ensign Kember. A lot of people uh, love Ensign Kember, who has been kind of a breakout character. We're going to explore her more, you know, give give uh, the people what they love, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, we're going to go more into uh, Durham, which is the town which the uh, Vinzalians uh, have, uh, well, no spoilers, but um, it's, it's in a somewhat precarious position, and uh, we're going to explore that more. Excellent. Yeah. So what would you, what would you consider your uh, hardest, the, the thing you struggle with the most? When you're writing, ah, <sighs> starting, starting is the thing I I struggle with the most. Uh, once I get going, I'm 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 usually good for it, but actually getting started on the thing that I love the most in the world is surprisingly difficult. Uh, I have had to come up with all kinds of tricks to get myself to start writing, uh, including you know going to coffee shops, changing my environment. Uh, I go to a place called Hacker Dojo in San Jose, which is a great maker space. Mm -hmm. A lot of techie kind of people hang out there. And it's a great environment for writing. And, uh, you know, if I had to give some advice to other people who are, you know, have trouble starting their writing, I would say look to your environment and look to the context of your environment. Don't uh, if you're having trouble with it, don't try to write in the same place where you're watching Netflix and playing video games because that is, you know, that is not preparing your brain uh, for the writing process. Uh, change your environment, switch it up, go anywhere, even just turn your desk around and, and try that. Excellent. I like that. Um, what are you reading now? For the first time in like two years, I am not reading anything right now. This is, you've caught me in like, you've caught me in that one in a million week when I'm actually not writing anything, reading anything. And I realized that the other day and it bummed me out so much. Um, I have just been so busy with the launch and with publicity and with my day job, which I still have for the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, And I have neglected my reading, but um, I am, I guess I'm I'm still in the middle of Passing Strange by Ellen Clagies, and I plan to pick that up again. Oh, I've been wanting Uh, to read that. How is it? The first few chapters are just beautiful. Um, I just, I love it so much and it was so hard to not go back to it, to, 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 uh, to put it down and pay attention to the book launch and give all my attention to that because it is just so beautifully written. The characters are just so deep and wonderful and you fall in love with them. Uh, and yeah, I am, I am just, oh, I'm jonesing for it. You can tell. Yeah. Yeah, she and just I put th- out a short story collection, I think, that I've mm-hmm. also been wanting to get. Yeah. But go on, sorry. <laughs> and uh, let's see, I think um, I think on audiobook, I don't know what I'm going to do next. I might start the Foundation uh, series. I haven't read that yet, and that's one of those things that like every sci-fi person is supposed to read, so I'm going to give that a shot. Okay. I'm usually reading like two or three things. I'm usually reading two fiction books and a nonfiction book at any given time. And so like, it's a weird week for me. So do you find, um, I know a lot of writers argue about this. Do you like to read within your genre or do you prefer to read outside your genre? And how does that change when you're actively writing a book? Uh, I would say that I prefer to read in my genre, but I force myself to read outside of it. Uh, I think, and this is, you know, this is one of those pieces of advice that seems universal to me. It might not be universal to everyone, but so, you know, caveats apply. Uh, But I think it's important to, you know, step outside of the tropes and conventions of your genre, kind of cross-pollinate, if you Mm -hmm. will. Um, 
get ideas, uh, subconscious or otherwise, uh, conscious th- conscious ideas, otherwise uh, called theft uh, in other fields, but in writing, it's called inspiration. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, this is what keeps genres from becoming stale. Uh, and I think this is the reason that we're getting so many wonderful genre books these days, uh, is in large part because reading outside your genre has become so easy with technology and, you know, the connectedness of everybody. It used to be, you know, you'd, you'd kind of go to the bookstore, you'd head to, you know, you'd head to your favorite section because that's the area where you know you've got books that you like and now you're connected to goodreads and reviews and stuff and so you you know you can hear about the good stuff in other genres and i really recommend that that writers take advantage of that and read outside their genre as much as they can yeah i also try to keep people from avoiding their genre because you need Mm -hmm. to know what's going Mm -hmm. on however um I was very unsure of myself in writing my last book, and I was reading a book that was award-nominated in my genre, and I had to put it down at some point because I kept comparing myself and just (laughs) feeling worse and worse and worse as I kept reading this awesome book, and I had to put it down while I was uh, writing because I was just second-guessing every every decision I made because it wasn't like this book. So mm-hmm. I can see the argument about people saying don't read within your genre, but I think happy medium is the place to go. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, if that is a problem for you, you know, yeah, when you're writing, stay outside your genre, take breaks and read in your genre, you know, take a mm-hmm. take a week off or something of writing and just read within your genre. Um, Personally, I used to suffer from that. And I wish I know how I broke the habit. I don't know. It just, as far as I know, it just kind of went away at some point. And I don't worry about that anymore. Wow, I'm jealous. Uh, (laughs) I'm going to think about that, though. I'm going to try to figure out how I manage that. And uh, maybe write a book about it. There you go. (laughs) That sounds good. Yeah. Uh, so when you turn in your sequel, what's next for you? Uh, I have a bunch of ideas on the table. And, you know, it's one of these, uh, what, what's that fable about the horse that starves to death between two equally alluring piles of hay? Uh, is that an Aesop fable? That's kind of me right now. Uh, I am... So I've got two main ideas that I'm thinking of. So, it, it, why, don't, why don't you give me some feedback? You can tell me which you like more. Okay. So I've got, um, so one is kind of going in a space opera direction. Uh, and I'm thinking of, uh, you know, a crew experiencing time dilation, uh, sort of a, you know, inspiration, quotation marks, from Forever War. Uh, and, you know, observing the the future history of the human species as it moves out through the galaxy uh, and getting into little, you know, Firefly style adventures and stuff like that. And then I have another novel that I'm thinking of doing uh, about a woman who speaks to the devil. And that one's semi-autobiographical. So, uh, so what do you think? What's your take I on that? I got to hear more about the speaking to the devil and uh, what do you do when you speak to the devil? Is it I mean anyone can speak to the devil, it's whether it answers or not, right? Yeah, yeah. So my my uh in my imagining, uh the devil will simply appear to this woman at some point and just kind of start fucking with her life. It's kind of it's a bit of a uh it's a bit of a job situation with the uh with the higher parties reversed. Well, those are very different uh genres so yeah think, they are aren't they yeah i think you would have to decide what you're in the mood for mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah i think i'm just gonna leave it for a, it's a game day decision right yeah mm-hmm. yeah that's a good point yeah that's how i've been trying to decide what my next project is just <laughs> how i'm feeling at the time because my ideas are also all over the the genre map so mm-hmm. um yeah. So, and I there... think you know, there's um, 
there's I think there's something to be said for that. You get into this argument uh, always about, you know, should you stick with your genre and so keep all your same readers? Should you go outside your genre and try to pick up new readers and cross them over? And just ultimately, I think, you know, what's what's your best book is the question. You know, what's your best book? And then write that whatever genre it may be in. Yeah, you do that. I think you can't go far wrong. The um, the thing, the way I feel about it is, <laughs> with with my last book, I, I wrote the one that sold, so mm -hmm. I, I didn't have the the option to write another urban fantasy because that's not what sold. Yeah. So that's that's another way to look at it is you write what people will buy. What's going to pay the bills? Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Uh. So is there anything you wanted to talk about that we have not touched on? Oh, I should have come prepared for this. Um... No is fine. I'm not put. I'm what, not trying to put you on the spot. What are your thoughts on proton decay? I I think protons probably decay at some point. You know, with a half life somewhere on the order of about fifty trillion years. What are your thoughts on that? You know, I'm going to defer to you. I think uh, <laughs> I'm going to go with you on that. This is the important not... problem. People need to start thinking about this. This is the ultimate environmental disaster of the universe, right? What are we going to do without protons? We Should we start, start saving them? Now. Are you saying like, you know, we're going to come up with a mutual fund for protons, start saving, <laughs> make sure we're using them properly, invest <laughs> properly with your protons? You know, it's, it's, it's the storage that's important, you know? It's no point saving them if they all just decay. We're going to open the vault and it's just going to be a bunch of quarks in there from coming around. So what we do, we need a lot of uh, pasteurization for yes. protons. I think this is a good idea, yeah. Okay. People. Readers, start pasteurizing your protons now. Yes. It may seem like 50 trillion years is a long way off, but you'll be surprised at how soon it comes. Okay. I think, I think we've got a good plan here. So if, <laughs> if either of us runs out of fiction to write, uh, get on the mm -hmm. proton pasteurization track before anybody else does. Mm-hmm. Yes, make sure exactly. we get all the investors. Yeah, this is this is a growth industry. You want to get in on the ground floor. Exactly, exactly. So, uh, contact Robin if you have thoughts on this. Um, and you've mentioned you're on Twitter. Can you give us your web page and your Twitter? Oh, absolutely. Uh, my web page is www.robinbenis.com, and that's R O B Y N B E N N I S. And my Twitter handle is at according the number two and Robin, R O B Y N. And, you know, hit me up anytime. All right. I'll have this in the uh, blog and show notes. And thank you so much for being on the show, Robin. Thank you so much for having me and for discussing proton decay in an adult and mature manner. Well, you know, too many people just get too passionate and start screaming about it. And I'm just mm -hmm. trying to bring a little bit of civility back to yeah, the discussion. Exactly. You know, really, the solution is probably halfway between the extremes in, in proton decay. That's so true. <laughs> well, the book is Guns Above. The author is Robin Bennis. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you very much for having me. If you would like to email me questions or just comments about the podcast, you can email MightyMurr at gmail.com. On Twitter, I am MightyMurr. You'll find the show notes at the URL I just said and information on how to get Robin's books. Robin's book and my books. I do have a book coming out in a couple of months called I Should Be Writing. Fancy that! I would love it if you pre-ordered it. It would make it look really impressive. I also have a science fiction book called Six Wakes, which has gotten really, really good reviews. People say very nice things about it. It is a clone murder mystery in space. If you don't feel like buying the books, but you want to support me in another way, I have a Patreon, and that is at patreon.com slash mightymur. And you can uh, support the podcast or support my writing and find out more of all the different perks you can get there. I think that's everything. Hope to get a uh, hope to get this up tonight, but I have to leave shortly, and I hope I'll come back. And I still have to edit all this, so we'll see. We'll see if this comes up on Monday or Tuesday. Let's cross our fingers for Monday. And then, of course, I have to get to work because I should be writing, and so should you.